Greg. Hey, how you doing, Bob? Good. It's good. What's going on today? So today we have Dance Safe. And, you know, by the name, you might think something completely different than what it is. But we've been trying to get Dance Safe on here for a while. We have. I am so excited. We had them scheduled and something came up and we have been patiently somewhat patiently <laughs> we, we haven't been patient no we've been so excited <laughs> we've been ready questions prepared we want answers uh, i i know our listeners are, are going to very very much enjoy this this podcast because this is it's not different than what we normally present but the energy and and the information is is going to be jam-packed it is yeah you know, yep. we have Jessica on. She's the chief uh, growth and impact officer. Um, they're, they're doing huge things and they're probably more, more visible than, than we probably give. I, yeah. To. Yeah. I think of because of um, our demographic mm -hmm. and where we're located or everything about, especially you and I, mm -hmm. that we probably, um, We'll never run into them in person. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but some of our other listeners, <laughs> well, have we been vague enough? <laughs> have we piqued your interest as to who Dance Safe is? <laughs> if so, without further ado, today joining us on the Totally Preventable Podcast, we have Jessica Breeman, the Chief Growth and Impact Officer at Dance Safe. How are you doing today? I'm doing lovely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. Our pleasure. We are super excited to have you. Yes. Um, yeah, it was um, long anticipated. It is. Yes, we were. We were excited when you agreed. We, um, someone in the office was saying, "Oh, wow, that's like a huge accomplishment." Yeah. They were very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's fanning in the office. That's right. Yeah. Even our editor, our you better have great questions. <laughs> so we're, we're hoping we're giving great questions to you. She'll let us know. If yeah. not great. <laughs> Well, thank you for all the love and support. We wouldn't be here without you all and just much love and support back. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm guessing not many of our listeners know what Dance Safe is. Could you explain it? Yeah, absolutely. So Dance Safe is a um is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh we were founded uh by Emmanuel Severios uh back in 1999, so we just, uh, 1998, excuse me, we just passed her 26th birthday. Uh, it started in the Bay Area uh, in like Oakland warehouse parties uh, doing pill testing. Um, our mission is to promote health, safety, and fulfilling experiences for people to use drugs and their communities. For a long, long time, up until about a year ago, um, it was really centered around uh, EDM music um, and fulfilling experiences there. But we just refreshed our mission um, about a year ago uh, and really expanding it uh, with the dynamic times and, and um, unfolding culture. Uh, our vision is a world free of systemic oppression and drug prohibition, where all people have the cognitive liberty, bodily autonomy, and resources to thrive. Uh, we currently serve various U.S. regions. Uh, we've got chapters all across the United States. Um, our headquarters is, is here in Denver, uh, Colorado, but we are dispersed. Our team is dispersed and mainly works remote um, unless we're in, in person at an event. Um, we're primarily known for the harm reduction services at nightlife and music festivals. Uh, we serve million, millions of patrons, and most notably, we do the drug checking now. Wow. I don't know why I was thinking that pill testing was something new. When she said <laughs> 1998, I was like, wow, they were testing pills in 98? But, you know, be, I guess because it's so um, so media forward now I, mm -hmm. I never i never even thought about it past then so that's that's why yeah. harm reduction is a little, not really new to us but new to um new to something that we do we've we've been known for just prevention here at the prevention coalition for so long and over the last few years we've decided well we got to get in on harm reduction we need to um you know meet people where they are um and keep everyone safe so um, I, we're learning a lot about harm reduction here lately. 
We are. I don't know if you could speak to this because um, you said there was it was founded with someone else. But what was the um, what was the the draw to to start up such an organization as Dance Safe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really, the draw. Um, so Eman. Um, <laughs> He, he's an anarchist. Um, and so he's, you know, we've really been building off uh, the shoulders of, um, you know, the, the founder and the philosophy about that. Um, you know, Iman had always thought that he was going to be arrested for doing this as well. Um, but no one has ever been arrested or had any criminal charges or anything doing this, even through, um, you know, the Rave Act and all of that. Um, but it was really just uh, in direct response uh, to the consequences of the criminalization of MDMA uh, that ended up happening um, and the war on drugs. Um, making sure that people had the most accurate information, non-biased information, um, education, education, they knew what they were putting in their bodies and they could make the, the best decisions um, for, for themselves. Um, so in the Oakland warehouse parties, they would set up the pill testing and, you know, he, he, he does tell stories about um, you know, a misrepresented substance. Um, and since it was so contained, um, they were able to pinpoint who was distributing um, mm -hmm. the misrepresented substance um, and prevent that um, from being from being ingested from people. And they were able to easily put out alerts. And, you know, the model does sound very familiar now, except we're on more of like a national basis instead of like a local basis. Um, across the United States. And then of course, we've got we've got the chapters who really focus locally. So um, really just the devastating consequences from from the war on drugs. Wow. That that must have been a huge thing because you figure that the rave community is it's a specific community. And to be able to test right there, oh, there's an unfamiliar substance mm -hmm. and be able to eliminate it. That that had to be huge because now. You're in this community. Everyone knows that, you know, in the community who who supplied it and just to have an answer of who's got the the thing that's that doesn't belong here. Is, mm -hmm. That's yeah. a, imagine a life saved just from that. Just from that. That's yeah. Huge. Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Um, I got a chance to go on the drugs data site, um, which I found super interesting. Um so can you give us a little um, information on how it works and what people can find out on that site? Yeah, so um, on a high level, it is uh, the only DEA licensed um, confirmatory testing facility that the U.S. has. Um, more should be rolling out soon, but um, uh, it's been around I think it was started in 2000, 2001. Uh, Eman also had a hand in that, uh, but worked very closely with Earth and Fire, uh, who, who now run that. Uh, but you can anonymously mail in um, samples. It used to only be ecstasydata.com. Um, and then recently, well, five years, don't mark me on that. Maybe it's been that long, time just flies. Um, they ended up changing it to drugs data. Um, so you can, you can submit any drug sample that you have, and they have a GCMS machine, uh, which is one of the most sophisticated um, one of the most sophisticated machinery for drug checking um, that we have. So if you're at home um, using reagent kits or fentanyl test strips uh, and you want to confirm, or if you don't have those accessible to you, you can mail those in and then they post that all online. The other thing that they uh, have done in the past I'm not going to say the other thing that they do uh, is um, act as uh, like a feed from other sources from other countries. So they also display results from around the world from other drug labs that are doing the same thing. Um, so you can get a picture of the sample, you can get what it was expected to be the location it was sent into. Um, some of the reagents, you can get the um, the color, the color reactions of that, uh, and then you can get what it it did test as. Uh, in the United States, they don't um, for like 
ecstasy pills, if you were going to turn in like a, a pressed, a pressed pill, um, they don't give you the milligram. Um, the ones that do display from other countries will give you, will give you the milligrams in that. Um, so just a wealth of information and just a longstanding database of, of drug samples, drug trends. Uh, and it's an easy way to, um, to even locate, uh, a, a, a batch of, of, of drugs that you may have, uh, and get more information. You, you mentioned reagents. What are reagents? Yeah. Reagents, uh, they are color metric, uh, tests that you can use. Um, I actually, I have this, uh, so they're color metric tests that you can use. Um, we'll try to put this up there. Wow. Um, you can see that they come like the little dropper bottles. Um, we have nine total, uh, but there are certain ones that you want to put together and use uh, to, to test certain substances where you want to use multiple ones. Um, but the chemicals inside of the each reagent uh, react differently to different um, to different drugs, different common adulterants. Um, and so you can use this uh, with our color chart. Let me open this up. You can use those with our, our color chart. And I will show that to folks. Wow. Um, and you can see the different reagents on the top. And then you can see different substances and common adulterants misrepresentations here. So you can use the reagent or uh, several reagents in combination um, to look for really red flags. Um, it's not there to, uh, it tests um, presence for a substance, not potency or purity. Mm. Um, and uh, it really takes on, it, it, one of the, it, it can take on the most dominant, the most dominant substance in a, in a sample or a darker color reaction. Um, so you can never know 100% how, how, potent something is, but it's very powerful if you were testing something such as, I'll use the example of MDMA. Um, you can't really tell the difference between MDMA and MDA uh, by taste, by smell, by look, uh, but using these, you can tell the difference between MDMA and MDA. You may not be able to tell if it is um, you know, all of the adulterants in it, uh, but it's really good information to have where, you know, MDA has a little bit different onset. It's got a little bit uh, different, it's got different, um, uh, it's more visual um, and the dosage is less, but the duration is more. So instead of, you know, four to six hours, it's six to eight hours. And so it's all really good information to have. Um, and then if you use a, uh, if you use sometimes a combination of different ones, you may be able to tell that um, or have an indication um, that the substance may be cut with methamphetamine, uh, for example. Um, so it's there to really not confirm necessarily, but also make sure that you, um, you're looking at red flags that may be in your substance for common adulterants and common misrepresentation. Now, how long should a uh a person who who wants to test, how long should they give themselves to test accurately to, to use like your kit? Because some people may be wanting to use right away thinking, you know, I'll just do this little dab and be done. Or is it something that you should give yourself 10, 20 minutes for? So depending on your experience with it, um, you know, it, so reagents, they, they, they can be just as much as an art as they are a science. Um, the drug market is changing all the time. And so the, the consistent research and development that we also have to do um, to keep up with those. Um, we have, I don't, if you've been on our social media, uh, Rachel, aka Sputnik, uh, she, she runs all of that. Um, but she continually reaches out to the community on all sorts of platforms uh, to get information of um, unusual reactions with these and um, something that just may not match up. Um, so we're continually researching and, and getting that feedback, but the tests themselves um, most of the time are, are fairly simple um, and an MDMA test um, would end up taking somebody just a couple of minutes. 
Uh, when we set up at festivals to do this, we've got lines of people and we service hundreds of th thousands of people a night, depending on depending on the festival. Um, so it is very, very simple where where the complexity may come in a little bit um, is maybe a, a a bit of an odd reaction that you need to do a little bit more digging in and a little bit more investigation of. Um, but most of the time it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Um, fentanyl test strips also only take usually a couple of minutes to do. Um, once you once you set it up and the strip is uh, it's got the it's got the sample um, uh, running up through capillary action, um, and we can talk about any of that if you want. Um, you set it down and you let it sit for a couple of minutes and you get the results. Um, what I would say that we also have an FTIR machine as well um, that does take a little bit longer, um, but that not only can tell you the presence of a substance, um, it it tests your drugs, essentially tests your drugs with a laser, um, and then every substance has a fingerprint, and then it compares those fingerprints found in the substance to different libraries. So as long as um, the substance, it has a, a, a sensitivity threshold. Uh, as long as the substance has, uh, it's over 5%, it'll not only tell you the presence, um, it will also tell you approximate percentages of that sample as well. Um, the FTIR is one of the most uh, sophisticated machines that can be taken um, on the road as well and set up at festivals. It's not something that someone's really going to have at their house, but they are popping up around the community. Um, you know, Yerlix in New York has one. Um, so community-based drug checking programs, um, government-funded drug checking programs are starting to invest in these. Um, so the reagents and the, the test strips take a minimal amount of time, can be done at home, readily available. Um, you know, some of the learning curve with some of the, the more complex uh, reactions. Uh, the FTIR uh, is done uh, by someone who is more highly trained. Sometimes they've got a, uh, like a, a scientific background. Um, there's a lot more setup and calibration. Those tests take a little longer because of that, but the results are, um, are at an advanced level of specificity and um, accuracy. Uh, and then if you were going to go through something like uh, confirmatory testing where you would send it into drugsdata.org, that could take that could take four weeks. That could take six weeks, uh, just depending on their backlog. And they do try on the website to let you know how long it's going to be before you see before you see your sample on there. Um, but for somebody who's doing this at home and immediately, um, that is totally there. And makes this makes a lot of the risks reduced and totally preventable. I feel like everyone must be a chemist at Dance Safe. Like, yeah. <laughs> just looking at that chart, I was like, oh, <laughs> big work went into it. And that it's is, right? that is... Yes, I love it. Um, and we're, we're going to soon, hopefully, we're, you know, we're continually trying to make this this easier, more simple. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hoping to have like reaction videos. And the other thing that, you know, to talking about this with this isn't a one size fits all. And depending on the region you're at, um, you know, different color reactions can react in different ways. So another thing that Sputnik has been doing is getting those color samples from all over, from all the field testing that's happening to show the range of um, a specific substance being tested, um, known combinations of that. So then people have a much more accurate um, view of the landscape on what they're doing. So lots of lots of goodies um, coming down coming down the pipeline for us. Right. Um, when you were talking about people lining up at festivals to have their drugs tested, um, how how do you get around law enforcement with something like that? I would imagine that. Um, they would love to jump in that line and start checking people's pockets. I, I bet. So sometimes they do. Um, it really just depends. Like we, we will, you know, really it's the education, right? That is most people think that 
you know, even, even if we're talking to about fentanyl, right. But like misrepresentation, like the example that I had shared around MDMA versus MDA, right. Um, uh, we will, we'll, we're here to like build bridges uh, and not to break them. Like we don't do renegade testing, um, but we really try to build close collaborative relationships to all of the stakeholders at the events that, that we're working. And there are some promoters, there's some venue owners um, who have a lower risk tolerance um, because the Rave Act still is in place. Um, it, it still is there. Uh, it is being used currently to block and shut down like safe use sites, um, um, like uh, I believe it was Safe House in, in Philadelphia um, that used that piece of legislation. Um, but again, in our 26 year history, no one has ever been arrested. No one has ever had legal repercussions like at all from doing this. Um, so the risk is very, 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 very low, especially since this legislation came out in like 2003 from Biden, like there's just been a lot of time that has passed. Um, you know, the, the culture is changing, the political landscape is changing. Um, um, yeah, it, there's just a lot of changes in the way that are unfolding, but regardless of the, ro the low risk that goes along with these services, we'll set up a table and just have information like our drug cards, mm -hmm. uh, just have information on heat stroke, allow, you know, have water, candy, um, earplugs, sunscreen, um, just to get there and have conversations with people because that's where it really is. It's like the conversations, it's the relationships that we're building. Um, but then we, we service festivals where we are in, um, close collaboration with law enforcement where they do bring us samples. Um, you know, if they find a sample on the ground, what we call ground score, they'll bring it to us. Um, if there's somebody who's going into the sanctuary space, um, who is having like a, ch a challenging psychedelic time or is acting, um, their behavior is uncharacteristic for the substances that they may um, have shared that, that they had ingested. Um, or if there's a story that that gets told, um, that education, a lot of times they come to us. And we also try to have really integrated teams um, where we're we're not only in collaboration uh, with security, law enforcement, but we're also in collaboration with the sanctuary space, medical. Um, so we all are part of this like dynamic ecosystem of care and risk. And now I, I guess I'll bring up as well, you know, Dan Safe, we use harm reduction. We are a harm reduction organization, but we use harm reduction to meet people where they're at. Um, you know, it has become a lot more mainstream term. People are familiar with it. They're they're getting um, there's a lot more shared understanding of the philosophy behind it, the the practice behind it, the value behind it. Um, but we're also really trying to shift that narrative um, and the cultural narrative around it into risk reduction, but benefit maximization, uh, because we it's for us, it's not about just like not dying, um, that's part of it. Um, but it's also how do we create, you know, these fulfilling experiences? How is it for wholeness and wellness? I mean, people take drugs for all sorts of reasons um, and it may not be for coping or, or you know, these part of the challenging parts of it, right? And challenging relationships with drugs. Um, and, um, but also the benefit, the creativity, the relationship, deepening of relationships, um, happiness, uh, all of that. So we really do try to look at this as a way uh, to maximize those benefits for as many people as possible and reduce and mitigate the risk, any of the risk that there is um, for as many people as possible um, in the everywhere all over the world. <laughs> I, I can just imagine the sigh of relief that festival goers, as well as law enforcement, feel when they see, you know, the dance, the dance safe vehicle pull up. I mean, I, I feel that there's a, 
Most of them. Uh, right, right. <laughs> but I feel like for, for the festival goers, a, a layer oh, of, yeah. you know, safety that they're feeling as you, as you know, their vehicle probably pulls up. Um, you did mention misrepresentation, but what about misinformation? Are you, does Dance Safe ever come across misinformation or hear things and you're just like shaking your head like, I can't believe people are actually trying to put this out there as true? We, can, we can't keep up with it. Oh. We can't keep up. So Sputnik, <laughs> I feel like I wish Sputnik was here because I'm talking about it. <laughs> 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 um she so she runs our social media right now um she took over the the big role of um outreach director as well um a national outreach director and she's also our education manager um you know and you were talking about scientists and and knowledge like the 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 amount the amount of education and knowledge uh that the people do have in this this organization and it does it takes a village right it's so hard to know everything and like the internet is such a blessing in so many ways but then there is also the shadow side where part of part of Sputnik's role is people sending information in and validating it and putting out um you know, putting out putting out content on trends in in misinformation that are on like a very very large scale. Um, we really do we really do take very seriously, uh, playfully seriously. You know that uh, misinformation is one of one of the largest harms that happen in this space and in the community. Um, and there is also this this part of like re-education that has needed to happen. Um, you know, it's just say no. Um, we if you go on, you know, drugs.gov, the amount of outdated and misinformation that's on there, some of it can be some of it can be generational. Um, but just listening and learning and um, you know, trying to understand where people are at in their in their journey and in their knowledge um is a large part of what we do. And we're also very, very, very cautious conscious um around the words i don't know mm. because there is we don't know everything and like you know it is it, it is a village and and understanding new information and you know even new technologies um you know um new new studies like if we look at if we look at uh like psychedelic assisted psychotherapy you know there is this part where um people are like, well, there's not enough data, but there was so, there was such a block in being able to know and understand um, that of course there's gonna be a lack of data. So there's just this whole world that is opening up. Um, and you can imagine uh, since, you know, the Reagan era, um, since we were founded in 1998, um, the amount of, the amount of tension and the amount of misinformation and just, flat out propaganda um, that has been, that the organization has come up, come up against. Um, so, you know, with all of these like cultural and political changes and innovations and change and knowledge that perceptions, philosophies that, that are happening, um, having those conversations has just gotten easier and easier over the years, which is which has been really really rewarding. Um, and I think the final thing that I I'll say is, um, even with uh, volunteers and um, chapters, uh, when we have pe folks coming into the organization and super passionate about the work, like our training program, we actually just refreshed all of that and revamped that. Um, because even what we had put out, uh, the information that was in our training program that was put out, you know, seven years ago, there's new information, there's new things. So it's just this constant, um, you know, reflection on, on, you know, what is our version of reality now? What has it been? What do we know? What have we learned? Um, and how do we, how do we put out the most accurate and non-biased information that we can? I can't tell you the amount of respect I have 
for a person, individual, or an organization that's not afraid to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Instead of giving me some answer that I'm going to find out isn't the truth or isn't the full truth down the line. Now, you know, I got to rethink life because you you, you told me something <laughs> true. But I, I, it is refreshing to hear an organization that's, you know, we stand behind like if I don't know it, I don't know it. I'm not going to send you, give you fake information. I'm not going to give you a half wit answer. I'm, I don't know, but I can get back to you. That is so refreshing to hear mm-hmm. hear that. Yeah, we like to dig when when we when someone tells us something, we like to dig and yeah. make sure they really know what they're talking about. <laughs> Greg doesn't always like to dig as much as I do. Yeah. But... <laughs> no, I'm that first Google answer. That's it. <laughs> hey, yeah, and we. We're, we're on that side. Like, yes. we usually dig. Like, we'll see something and we're like, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so you mentioned your drug cards and we had a conversation um, before we introduced you. Um, so I'd just like to um, tell our, our listeners, because if they've been at an um, event, an adult event that we have been at, they've likely seen our drunk, drug cards. And um, that's how we got associated with you. Could you explain the drug cards if people haven't seen them? Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can find them online as well. Uh, a lot of the information is, is, uh, on our website too, but they are postcard size drug information cards, um, about all of the most common drugs, um, MDMA, ketamine, cocaine, alcohol, benzos, um, 2CB, uh, we have, we have a plethora of them. Um, so on the front side is just very beautiful, um, representative, um, in, I guess you could say interpretation art of, um, of that specific drug kind of, you know, the way that it's like, the sensory, the the senses of the drug, how does, you know, a representation of how it looks, how it feels, you know, um, what what are the colors, like, what's the vibe of it, and then on the back, uh, it shares a lot of information um, about dosage, um, effects, uh, risks, uh, common adulterants. Uh, and so it's just really good information. Uh, we, they've been around for a long, long time. Um, they've gone through various iterations of art. Um, and, you know, it, as you were talking about misinformation, um, I mean, there's cards that I have at my house when I've read the back of them, you know, even from 15 years ago, I was like, well, I'm glad we updated. <laughs> <laughs> And, and things like that. So, you know, we're, we're constantly looking at those, constantly updating those, constantly taking feedback, what's going to be most helpful. Um, we try to fit um, the, the most valuable and helpful information about them um, on the back of one card. So um, yeah, constant, constant improvement um, and feedback and feedback on those, but they are a staple. Um, there was a, you know, it's a, it's part of our history. Um, there's been, you know, we've gotten pictures of buses on inside of like buses that's been lined with them that people had and like drove to Burning Man. And, um, we always get, get pictures of, of, um, of people in the community who still have theirs from the first time they ever went to the dance safe booth. Um, So definitely a collector's item through the years, but a wealth of information as well. They're a great eye catcher. We started with just a set and people would be at a table and be like, oh, my friend so-and-so could really use this information. Can I take it? So then we got, I think we have like a hundred of each or whatever, and we have a little spinny thing for them, but it really gets conversation started. a lot of times we'll be places and people think like we are the no fun people, you know, we are the prevention people. Um, You know, they don't even want to tell us they drink. We are the no fun people. So um, this has really started a conversation for us, especially with like um, young adults too. young adults usually just pass us by, but they see this and they're, they're interested. They want to learn more. They realize we're just we're there for healthy reasons, you know, we're, we're not there just to shake our finger and say no. Um, so they've been super helpful getting people engaged with us. So, yeah. In other words, your card. 
Yes. <laughs> they brought a street <laughs> yeah. we, got we, back. Be back. <laughs> we do notice when we're set up at like a booth or an event or something, that is one of the biggest things that people that draws people they because you can kind of see it from a distance and they're bright they're fun and they're just like what's going on over here and it really does start that conversation and um we I think it was the I think it was students for sensible drug policy who coined this but we do use it um it it's instead of just saying no and o k n o w um so yeah and I believe it was SSDP uh, who coined that, um, but we like to use that a lot. You know, we're here, you know, to to just say no. <laughs> right. We like how those two words interact here. <laughs> yes. uh, okay. but, well, I was going to say the other thing we're eager to use is your chart of how drugs interact with one another. But um, we have to blow it up because some of us in the office need like a giant magnifying glass to see <laughs> Luckily, we have a big printer. So uh, when we go somewhere fun, we're going to blow it up bigger for people. Right. But it's great. That's that's awesome. And, and keep in contact with us, too. We're on we uh, I know that that we're working on flow charts as well for like uh, common substances, commonly um you know, tested what, what people are expecting, um, where it's like a flow chart of not only where to start, uh, but what reagent to use next, what are the different combination of colors you may get, and if you are getting a specific combination, it may have an adulterant over here that you may want to do. So again, continually trying to make it easier, continually trying to make it more user-friendly, more understandable. Um, so when you blow that up, hopefully we'll we'll have some we'll have some flow charts to go along. With it. Right. So so we out here we're we're kind of surrounded by a few major colleges and universities. Um, and back to school just happened. What would be what would be one or two tips that you can give to a parent about having a conversation? I think now the conversations are not only about prevention, but should should have a little bit of uh, harm reduction in there as well, you know, with the parent understanding that you are at a certain age and you may experiment, but what are one or two tips you can provide to parents to help them roll out that conversation? Yeah, um, the, I think, you know, and I, I have conversation with parents often where, Bridging this conversation um, is, has felt a lot harder for them over, um, you know, the condom conversation or, you know, harm reduction with, um, you know, sexual lifestyle and, and like bridging, I think bridging that gap, um, you know, because harm reduction can feel new, but sunscreen is harm reduction. Seat belts are harm reduction. Condoms are harm reduction. Um, all of these, all of these behaviors that we do to re reduce risk, maximize benefit, um, can be translated over to this. And I think for parents, it is um, really leaving an open conversation um, and welcoming that. Um, and if you are feeling uncomfortable or you are like that fear of having this conversation come up where if I talk about it, you know, is it going to somehow increase the use? Is it going to encourage it? Um, and, you know, most of science tells us, you know, with different studies that, um, it, it won't, um, but if you're if you're not going to give them the accurate and non non biased information or the space to talk about it, someone else will. And you hope that the information that they're getting off the internet, the information that they're getting from other people, um, is as accurate as possible. Um, so I think just like deepening, I think that <laughs> that deepening it into any sort of of uncomfortableness that you may have, um, and just stepping into it. And knowing that it's a it's an ongoing conversation, um, kids are gonna know, and kids are gonna have um, different cultures. I mean, again, there's new drugs coming out all the time. Um, not coming in it as like the expert, 
um, uh, that you have something to absolutely teach, but a, a collaborative and supportive, what I almost want to say like union on that, um, to be able to learn from one another, deepen in um, from one another um, and really being there because there, there's probably going to be challenging times and being able to build that trust with your kids for them to be able to share more about the challenging times, share more about, um, you know, a person may have a challenging relationship with one substance and a non-challenging relationship with another. Um, but as a parent, um, the, the care and the listening and the learning and advice when it's when it's warranted, um, you know, is only going to be also as good as the information, the information that you're giving. Um, so I think just trying to build a, a trusting space for dialogue and exploration um, without judgment, even if you're not agreeing with it, um, because if if that isn't there, the kids are also going to end up having that fear and hesitation um, talking to you. Um, the other, the so I think that that was a long winded one, <laughs> and I think the the other one is um, make the tools available to them. You know, um, the buy them their kit, um, buy them the fentanyl test strips. Um, have some. I do. I know some parents who uh, leave, leave the harm reduction tools, like the kits and the fentanyl test strips and everything, um, at their house in a basket. And when their college kids and high school kids come over, they take them. So people are using them. Um, but it may not be something that's as accessible to them. Um, especially in high school, maybe, you know, the, the, their forms of payment are, have too much oversight of it. And they're not in an environment where they can be open about that. Um, you know, it could be, um, yeah, it, for very, various of reasons, but if you make the tools available to them, um, and make the accessibility of not only the tools, but the education, um, it, it go a long way. I often offer tools, um, to my kids for their friends too. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens it up that if they need them. Um, they don't have to tell me they're for them they're themselves. Like they can take them for their friends if if needed. Mm -hmm. um, I I think my kids, because I'm in this job, are open enough with me. <laughs> but um, I find that with other things too. If you make things available here, if your friends need these, you know, please take them. They can take them and feel a little less worried about maybe what your reaction with is right now until they get a better feel for it. Yeah. 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 And I think if something challenging comes up and they call you and they need you, be there. It's interesting to, um, I almost feel like there was kind of this like generational distance in some ways, um, you know, with the past however many years. But now we're coming into this space where the distance is getting less between the generations too. And there's like this understanding like, you know, I'm, I'm headed into my forties as well. And like, when I was younger, 40 felt like so much, like, you know, so much of the distance was so much more, but it's like, you know, learning throughout, you know, through, as I started, you know, adulthood and, and doing all of that, like our parents are much cooler than we think sometimes. They are much, much cooler and they weren't born yesterday and they have a ton of experience. <laughs> so, so my kids, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping my kids say, <laughs> I mean, my parents were cool and it's just like other parents who, you know, who are in the same, you know, position and talking about this. And like, now it's, it's also interesting to be at this area uh, too, with like talking about EDM and raves where, um, you know, the people who were, who were doing this years back now they are, and have all this experience. They're like in their, they're in their like forties, they're in their fifties, you know? And so it's, um, yeah, there's just a lot of, a lot of, uh, lived, lived experience that, that parents have just a lot of lived experience around us. So. 
You hear that, kids? We have experience. <laughs> we know call your mom. Doing. Call your mom. Call your dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, for for organizations or for parents or for for concert goers or festival goers for anyone who wants to get in contact with Dance Safe, what's the best way to to get in contact? Yeah, um, if folks would like to volunteer, the first step is a self paced uh, training. Um, everybody has to go through that. It gives just a more information about the history, philosophy, um, the technologies. Um, education. Uh, it also shares a lot. We also have a We Love Consent program um, that's really based around uh, consent, consent culture, bystander intervention, uh, drugs and sex. So that that's something that we we didn't get into here, but it really shares just a, a breadth and depth of of um, of dance safe culture and harm reduction education. Uh, and then from there, um, if there you get connected to national, and then uh, if there is a chapter and you are interested in either doing starting a chapter or just volunteering with a chapter, uh, we'll get connect we'll get you connected with the nearest the nearest chapter there. Um, there's also opportunities for if it's media, we do have a media forum. If people are looking for Dance Safe, you're not necessarily looking to volunteer, but you are looking um, to request services. Um, there is a online as well a form to request our services. Um, and social media, we're on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. If you're not following us, please do in the stories on our feed, just education. It's funny. It's spicy. Um, and I mean, I, I follow it and I learn stuff all the time um, from, from the contents doing uh, that's going up on there. Uh, and uh, for the listeners, if there is something else and you would like to contact me directly as well, uh, it's Jessica at dancesafe.org. So. Awesome. And you have a great little shop too on your website too. So if you're. Oh, we do. Thank you. Yeah. And they, all of our, all of our swag that we currently have, um, uh, test strips right now, we've got amphetamine, um, xylazine and fentanyl. And then we also have all of the reagents on there. Um, we have the educational materials, uh, the, the drug checking cards. Some of those have turned into posters, uh, that that you can do. We have uh, we love consent literature zines that we've done, and then we also have uh, harm reduction supplies. So the micro scoops that go along things, uh, milligram scales, pill cutters, uh, anything uh, that can uh, help and support uh, your risk reduction and benefit maximization. I always love the podcast that we do where we get a lot of information out of it mm -hmm. but there's still a lot more information that we need to get you know if there were questions or a demo or anything yes please let me know when and where and um definitely looking forward to coming back and uh if i ever make my way to y'all or if you're ever in denver let's definitely let's definitely connect in person as well all right. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much, Jessica. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.